Digital Heritage is in charge of conceiving and developing future safety and comfort innovation for all the for all the inner vehicles. And Professor Stille is a professor and director of the Institute for Measurement and Control System at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. And also Professor Stille is a coordinator of the German Research Foundation's focus program on cooperative interactive technology. I would like to invite Professor Hermich for his talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. A very good morning and thanks for showing up so early. We really appreciate it, but get two for the price of one, so it's hopefully worth it. Uh, both Kristen and I had to be awfully silent for about three years while this project that we want to talk about was commencing. Um, when we had IB in Baden-Baden, I think we were just sort of in the final stages of negotiating our collaboration agreement. Uh, when we were meeting in uh, I call it the analyst, we uh, were busy coding, or at least our product team was, and last year on the Gold Coast, I was receiving daily reports on how the test drives worked. And so, finally, here we are, and we can talk a little bit more, uh, but I'm pretty sure that some of you at least have heard a little bit about this project um, ever since we came out uh, with the splash at the Frankfurt Motor Show last year. Um, so, nonetheless, I hope we can provide you a few more new insights. Uh, there are many people in the room, actually, who have already presented in posters or orals some portions um, of, uh, of this work. Um, I hope you're not getting tired with that, but, but there was a lot of things developed that involved a huge product team and actually allowed to dedicate this presentation to all the people who have worked so hard uh, on uh, making this project happen. I mean, there were times last summer where I really saw more of Julius Siegler in the car than I saw of my wife. And I mean, nothing against Julius, but well. So, um, how did this come about? Um, <coughs> at Mercedes Benz, we're really strong believers in driver assistance systems for the sake of both safety and comfort. And we think that autonomous driving is taking this to the next level. Uh, we make a clear distinction between the safety portion and the autonomy portion um, of this entire work. Um, and what frustrates me quite a bit is that many people really mix these two things up and say that only an autonomous vehicle can be a safe vehicle. I think that's pretty much bullshit. Uh, we, have, of course, have a good track record of improving vehicle safety by autonomous functions in emergencies. Um, so every, I don't know, eight million, seven million kilometers or so, we may catch the occasional human error in driving. Um, but when it comes to autonomy, it's not about those rare occasions, it's about getting those seven or eight million kilometers in between right. And that's a very hard thing to do because you should not you better should not generate any fault in between. So it's, it's actually the major challenge, uh, but that's probably a subject for a completely different talk. Now, we have worked on safety applications such as emergency braking. We have worked on um, uh, adaptive cruise control and variations thereof. And, and it cases very well to the Mercedes-Benz brand where safety and comfort sort of are at the core of everything that we do. We recently put this together in a package offering, which we call Intelligent Drive. Um, and that was really important because, I mean, with all these various functions, cross-traffic alert, adaptive braking, lane keeping, so on, it became pretty cumbersome for customers to understand what this all comprises. So with that, okay, we put this all in one package. We don't let customers select those individual things. We'll just roll out the entire package to them. And that's what we'll be doing in the future. And so you see new versions of these intelligent drive packages developed over the course of the next years. And the research work that we do and that we present now is actually supposed to find its way in future versions of these systems. When we introduced the S-Class a year ago, um, perhaps the 
One function in the IntelliBit Drive package received the most attention, and that is Stop and Go Pilot. Stop and Go Pilot is our first take at an autonomous feature in a production uh, vehicle. It's, it's level two automation, so it's partial automation, uh, but I have to say it feels a lot like level three. Um, at low speeds, you don't even need to touch the steering wheel. And Joe's presentation yesterday, when he showed you level two, uh, that was a video clip taken in one of our vehicles, actually, that was taken from an E-Class because what we managed over the course of the last year in record time was really that we rolled out these features across our entire limousine range. And we'll be extending that to the SUVs next year and so on and so forth. And the year after that, you'll be seeing the next generation of intelligent drive when the next E-Class vehicle comes out. And you have to wait and see what we have in store for you then. So, as we are going in level two, we're of course exploring what other levels we could reach. And especially going from level two to level three is really what concerns us a lot <coughs> and where much of our current work is focused on. Um, essentially, again, to increase customer comfort, to give them a little bit more freedom on what they can do in the car, you can very well argue that the safest level of these automation levels is level two and not level three or four because only at level two you have sort of the machine controlling or supervising the human and vice versa. Uh, and so you have uh, the best of both worlds in terms of safety. But again, let's not go down that path. Uh, we wanted to pursue how much automation we can do um, and whether we can leave um, level two altogether. Um, when we do this, we thought, well, the degree of automation is only one element in what we can achieve um, or what we can deal with. What is also very important is the environment or the scenario in which we do automation. And those scenarios, of course, dramatically differ depending on how chaotic the traffic is around you or how fast you're going. Because both create elements of risk, speed is an element of risk, and chaos is an element of risk. So that determines uh, on how safely you can operate uh, in those domains. Um, the easiest thing, and, and that's exactly why you see this out as a product today, uh, is of course a traffic jam situation where your vehicle goes at pretty low speed and where all the other vehicles are fairly organized when driving around you. So that's ideal for a good view of, of what's happening in the scenario. And as soon as something happens, you can always step on the brake and the vehicle stops almost instantly without causing any damage. And so that, that is very good for automation. Um, now if you want to move on to other scenarios, you can move on each axis. You can either allow uh, the traffic to be a little bit more chaotic around you, or you could increase uh, your velocity. If you add more chaos into your system or allow for more chaos, then that brings you to a good application area for automation, which are all these parking applications. Again, you're going at a fairly low speed, but in contrast to the highway situation of a traffic jam, you really have other people driving, other cars driving from all directions and coming at you from a variety of positions. And you have other uh, traffic participants in those scenarios, which also makes that complicated. So that's one step. The other step would be that we remain in the structured traffic environment of the highway and increase the velocity. And that brings you to these typical highway pilot um, automation kind of applications. Where actually both things become fairly complicated is if you increase the velocity and increase chaos at the same time, and that brings you to those off-highway situations in urban environments, on rural <coughs> roads, uh, where everything really sort of um, becomes way more difficult. And just to, to show you how more difficult that becomes, um, just a few comparisons here. I mean, on the highway, you have pretty wide lanes, so if you're not, um, not positioning the vehicle exactly, right, uh, you can get away with that easily. Uh, an off-highway scenario, you have Narrow roads, those roads are not necessarily exclusive, so you may have traffic coming at you on your own lane and you need to 
coordinate with the oncoming traffic uh, on who goes first. And if you fail to do that, then ideally that just results in a deadlock. Uh, and hopefully it does not result in a crash. Um, as far as the direction is concerned, um, I mean, on a highway situation, it's the same direction for all. Um, again, I mean, you've bourbon or rural scenario, people are coming at you from all directions. Um, as far as maneuvers are concerned, on a highway, the only real maneuver that you're driving is a line change. Um, and merge or demerge are just variations of line changes. And even if you go for an emergency stop on the emergency lane, that just does a line change into the emergency lane. So that's a pretty straightforward implementation of what you need to do there. Um, on the off-highway scenario, you of course have all sorts of indirect obstacles that you have to pass. You have to pass parked cars, you have to pass um, other traffic participants such as cyclists and so on and so forth. You have intersections and you need to navigate through those intersections. Occasionally you have to turn. Um, and there are funny things like roundabouts, which, complete, uh, which require completely different maneuvering catalog altogether. So, way more variation. One element here is that you have to know what kind of maneuver is desired. And that's sort of the first decision you have to make before actually driving that particular maneuver. Um, as far as traffic signs is concerned, the only traffic signs on, on most highways, at least that I know, um, are speed limits. Uh, whereas in a rural and urban scenario, you have all other sorts of regulations. And worst of all, you have traffic lights. But we'll come to that later on. As far as the road users are concerned, on a highway situation, you just have vehicles, and as I said, on rural and urban roads, you have pedestrians and cyclists. All the way. Um, as far as you feel the view, and that's sort of the final comparison on this chart is concerned. On a highway, as you are going at high speeds, and as those roads are built for high speeds, uh, you typically have a wide field of view. You only have uh, a road curvature that is pretty smooth, but um, on the up highways, you know, you have sharp turns, you usually have an obstructed field of view. So, really, quite dramatically different in terms of difficulty. So coming back to the scenarios, um, a couple of years ago when we, when we started our work on autonomous vehicles, um, we of course had traffic jam covered at that time, and then it just took some, uh, some time to really build it and strengthen it to be able to put it into a production vehicle. Um, and we felt, and we still feel, that we have a pretty good grasp on what it takes to drive autonomously in a parking situation and what it takes to drive autonomously on a highway. Um, but where we exactly, or where we had no clue at that time, uh, was the off-highway situation. So the decision was pretty clear that we have to experiment and find out what's difficult and what's easy in such a scenario if we wanted to address that with vehicle mileage. I would say if we experiment, we, we need to have a test track, and we pretty early decided that we don't want to go for a closed test track, but that we wanted to go on a public road. Um, because only the public road, we thought, would give us a real feel for the kind of situations that may happen and the things that we need to account for. And then as we were sitting um, in a room sort of speculating about the various options that we had, um, over Franca at that time had already talked to Christoph Stiller and they'd come up with that idea. Well, uh, in 2013, uh, it's the, the anniversary of the original Berta Benz drive, and, and wouldn't it be nice to drive autonomously on the Berta Benz drive? And as soon as that idea was in the room, um, everybody said, hey, yeah, let's go for it. And uh, none of us, none of us had actually been out and, and seen that route. And I tell you, if I had seen that route before making that decision, uh, I would not have decided to drive on that route because it is tremendously difficult and it caused us a lot of frustration uh, sometime in the course of the project. But nonetheless, that route was picked. And, and why is it so special? Well, it's, it's, um, it goes back to the history of the Carl Benz company um, Carl Benz, one of the inventors of the automobile, um, had a very, how to say that, forceful wife. Uh, 
who is actually the driving force behind his entire endeavor. And then Carl Benz, as, as say, the prototype German engineer, spent years and years perfecting his invention uh, without ever selling a car. And uh, his wife actually had given him all the money. Actually, he had, she had given him her entire dowry uh, to, to run his company. And, and, and money was going up, running out. Yeah? And so she said, well, guy, we have to sell a car. Otherwise, we'll, we'll not be living for long. And, and then one day, she decided it's time for a public display of the usefulness of, of this invention. And, and she actually, she literally, in August 1888, one morning, stole the car from his husband, and together with her two sons, drove from Mannheim to Fordsheim, which is a stretch of about 100 kilometers, to visit her family. And in doing so, making it known that the vehicle was actually a useful invention. Um, and that drive was, of course, very heavily reported later on in the press. I mean, imagine, I mean, you've never seen an automobile before, and there it comes. I mean, people were running away from it and uh, thought the devil has come to earth or whatever. Um, and, and, and so uh, that really became a very famous event in the history of our company. And actually, after that drive, the year after that drive, Carl Benz sold his initial 10 vehicles, and that got us going, um, and hopefully keeps us going. So, that's a rack we picked, Mannheim to Fordsheim. Um, my wife always said, well, if I would drive that, I would use the Autobahn, um, and that's what you could do these days, but of course, that was not what we had intended to do. So, rural roads. We wanted to gain experience on those roads. We wanted to find out which technologies work and which technologies do not. We wanted to prepare ourselves for innovation beyond 2020, roughly that time frame. And of course, we wanted to recognize Bertha Benz um, in, her, in her historic role. Um, and that works particularly well for Karlsruhe because, of course, Christoph is just one of the successors of Carl Benz as part of the faculty uh, of the Karlsruhe University. So, how did we build the car? What is Bertha made of? Um, very early in the project, we decided that we wanted to do away with a few things that are sort of common in autonomous vehicles. We, we did not want to have an on-roof sensor suite. We did not want to have any, any very costly laser scanners on top of the vehicles because we felt that it would take too long to come up with something meaningful that can be put in a product that customers can afford to buy. So um, we wanted to give the vehicle a more or less normal appearance uh, we wanted to work with low-cost positioning um, and low-cost production-ready sensors. Um, and of course, we wanted to do away with this funny vehicle on the left-hand side. So we took a regular, um, regular uh, S500, um, uh, which, which constituted a bit of a problem because that car was obviously not out at the time we started the project, so we used other mule vehicles to do to do this work and only in very late stages of the project uh, and with all the covering and so on we, we used uh, we used the actual S class. Um, if I had the choice again I probably would not use the V8 engine for automation because if you tell it to go I tell you it goes. Um, and really have to spend some effort on, on getting the control algorithms right uh, and keeping the vehicle control. But that worked pretty well. We integrated quite a few sensors on the vehicle, but no sensors that are really not, not close to production. Um, at the foundation of the sensor suite of this vehicle are the radars, uh, long-range uh, long radars to the front, obviously, but also to the side and to the rear, um, which turned out to be very helpful at intersection of rural roads so that we can get a lot of coverage of uh, any cross traffic coming in. Um, and my radar guys always complain that they do not get enough credit. Let me say, the radar work is really the core and the foundation of all the sensor work uh, in this vehicle. Uh, the old problem of this is that my radar guys never come up with any good video footage. Uh, so that's why they don't get enough coverage in these presentations. Um, the people who come up, obviously, with good footage are the camera guys. Um, we have three cameras on this system. We have a stereo visual camera, 
which is pretty pretty similar to the stereo camera that we have in our regular production vehicles, only that we extended the base lens of the, uh, of the camera a little bit so that we can look farther or that we can uh, actually calculate 3D uh, information uh, for wider range in the vehicle. Um, we have a special camera looking at traffic lights. I'll talk about them later. And we have a third camera that we use for positioning the vehicle or some part of the positioning of the vehicle and Christoph's going to address that later on. As far as actuation is concerned, um, we, we needed some variations on the electrical power steering uh, in the vehicle and, and as far as, as acceleration and braking, we could just use the regular um, ACC uh, emulation in the vehicle. Um, let me emphasize to you that if we went to production with such a vehicle, and that is what many people overlook when, when it comes to designing vehicle, uh, autonomous vehicles, many, many people really just focus on the sensor portion, but uh, what is equally important if you want to build such a vehicle, um, that you actually have to have fault tolerant actuation in such a vehicle. So that is part of our current work, like uh, building uh, a fail-safe or fail-operational actuator platform for future vehicles so that nothing can go wrong if you do not have uh, the, uh, the human driver as an actuator. So, and with that, uh, we, we combine a few things here. Um, this is more or less the algorithmic structure of the system. Here you see all the sensors. Uh, that are coming, then you see uh, a big portion that is responsible for localizing the vehicle, uh, and that is fed by something that we call feature localization. We also look at lane marks, uh, and of course we have uh, one more vehicle sensors such as GPS and then some, uh, some other localization sensors. This goes all into localization, um, and that is fed into a planning algorithm. Of course, the planning algorithm gets also information from the objects we detect. Um, and gets information from special algorithms such as a traffic light analysis. Uh, and as I said before, the radar goes into that all in a planning thing. One, one thing we did not do, at, 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 or one, one bad decision we made in an early stage of the project is that we decided not to go into an extensive sense of fusion layer. That's probably something that we would revise if we would do it again. But this way we implemented things pretty much so that everything comes together in the planning, and Christoph will show you later on uh, on how that all goes together. Uh, and then we have the actuator, power steering, and the braking system. And then we have some clever visualization that gives you some assessment of what the vehicle does and what the vehicle intends to do. Um, and that was pretty neat as well. So that's pretty much what we have. And what we would like to do now for the next uh, 10 to 12 minutes or so, we'd like to show you a little, a little movie that we recorded while doing the project. Um, the funny thing is, this is actually uh, a world premiere outside of Bandu because we've never shown that video before, so I hope you will appreciate that. Um, and that gives you a feel for the entire project and what we did. A Mercedes-Benz S-Class in downtown Heidelberg. Dense traffic, pedestrians, cyclists, this is not a blocked off road or a test track. But just for safety reasons, the driver's hands have to be near the steering wheel. Because the S-Class drives by itself. We wanted a realistic picture what it takes to drive autonomously on country and city roads. So we said, let's check it out. The challenges were enormous. From the tiniest roads to highways, from villages to big cities, we had everything. The vehicle must be able to respond to unique situations instantly. So this is not at all comparable to a test track, where everything is always well defined. Exactly 125 years ago, Bertha Benz drives her husband Karl's patent Motorwagen from Mannheim through Heidelberg and Bruchsal to Pforzheim. The first ever long distance trip in a car. Now, once again, the Berta Benz route is to be the scene of a unique and pioneering venture. An autonomous distance journey over more than 100 kilometers in regular traffic.
Mercedes-Benz has continued to set standards in terms of driver-assisted systems with brake assist, lane and collision detectors and most recently the intelligent drive systems which for the first time even enable automated driving in stop-and-go traffic on motorways. Based on this know-how, the developers were ready to take the next crucial step, the step away from the motorway. On a motorway, traffic is very structured. The tracks all move in the same direction. You can change lanes, you can go faster, you can drive slower. This is not always easy, but it's comparatively simple compared to what we're trying to do now, which is to leave the motorway and deal autonomously with much more chaotic traffic situations. There are pedestrians and cyclists, all of whom we cannot put in harm's way. We have cars coming from the side. We have cars that turn in front of us. This is why we undertook this journey and started experimenting, to learn the proper techniques to solve these problems. The research vehicles are equipped with a total of eight radar sensors that register the environment at both close and long-range distances. When turning onto a main road, for example, this allows it to register whether there is any cross-traffic approaching. In addition, three cameras have been installed, including a stereo camera. The advantage of the stereo camera is that the car can see three-dimensionally, just like us. We can also calculate the speed of objects, which allows us to distinguish actual road users from the general static environment. The developers target to use only sensor components close to or ready for serial production. We didn't want to use very expensive, custom-made sensors because it will take decades for them to be affordable or reliable. We really wanted to use off-the-shelf sensors and solve the rest via clever programming. Still, the Mercedes-Benz engineers have to enter new technological territory in many fields and the challenges begin with the navigation. We really need to know to the centimetre where we are, where we want to go and how wide the road is. And if there's a curve, we need to know at what point we have to begin steering in order to make it through. A highly accurate map has to be processed for the entire Bata Benz route. Therefore, the developers travel the route using a vehicle equipped with cameras. Special software then uses this video material to extract the necessary information about the exact trajectory and borders of the lanes. In addition, video from another camera captures the key data on distinctive environmental features such as the edges of buildings, windows or lampposts. During the autonomous drive, cameras on board the research vehicle then compare and contrast these stored characteristics with the current environment. This allows the exact location of the vehicle to be continuously determined within fractions of a second. It's similar to hiking or sailing. You see a tower, you see a second tower. You measure the angle and calculate just about where you are on the map. Our system has around 5,000 points per image. This means that if points get lost, say, because a car is no longer parked somewhere, then it doesn't matter. All 155 traffic lights along the Berta Benz route also have to be marked on pre-made videos. Within the frame of this camera, the car has to recognize each traffic light signal absolutely reliably. The problem is that we need to be able to see it not only from a distance, but also when we're right up in front of it, when the traffic light is directly ahead but to the side. This means we need a very large opening angle for the traffic light camera, which makes it difficult to read a traffic light that's further away. 
the S500 Intelligent Drive sensors register the position, velocity and direction of objects up to a distance of 200 meters, faster, more accurately and more reliably than any human being could. Although, other road users are amongst the biggest challenges facing the team. Yes, such systems do detect everything at all times, and it's not possible for them to be distracted. The problem is that these data must be interpreted. As a human being, if I see a garbage can on the roadside, then I know it won't move. But for us here, we only see that there is an obstacle, and it could be a pedestrian, a garbage can, or part of a parking vehicle. Mercedes-Benz developers have to create sophisticated control software that must continuously align the data obtained from all sensors, that must identify other road users and predict their movement, and that always derives appropriate control commands from all this information. It's like the human driver's brain where all the information comes together. Then we have the algorithms that evaluate what information is relevant, whether an object is important in a specific situation or not, and then a decision must be made. Do I give way or can I drive now? And if I drive, where am I driving to? Definitely, this vehicle has something to do with artificial intelligence. But the car can only do things we've taught it to do. It can't learn independently. The first test drives as part of the project get underway in August 2012. When winter arrives, the first research vehicle has already covered hundreds of kilometers. Bertha 1, as it is affectionately nicknamed by the team. The two S500 Intelligent Drive are converted in early and mid-2013. However, numerous tests are necessary before the vehicles make the first attempts to navigate normal traffic. The engineers have to define the force with which the automatic control moves the steering wheel to make sure that the driver can still intervene safely. Wow, hell! How many Newton meters was that? Hey, I'm pretty strong then. In early April 2013, on a test track in the Swabian Hills, the S500 Intelligent Drive takes to the road autonomously for the very first time. It remains camouflaged as the new S Class has not been introduced to the public yet. We are quite satisfied. We have set a course on which we eventually want to drive, and the deviations we registered were all within our expectations. Our first real road trip, but without all the risks we would have on a public road. On April 16, 2013, 19 months after the project is launched, the first autonomous S-Class 500 receives official permission for road use. The first autonomous trip on public roads. All our senses were working at full blast, and of course the entire team was electrified. The rules for autonomous driving are clearly defined. A specially trained driver must sit behind the steering wheel and his hands must always remain close to it. All the systems I've been working with had to do with only short automatic procedures. It is truly an interesting or weird feeling to leave the car doing everything by itself. Safety comes first. We would rather interrupt a potentially critical situation than take any risks, least of all for others, but of course for ourselves as well. Our first autonomous drive, and it was quite good. Of course, we found a couple of mistakes, but for the first drive, it was okay. Yes, we can be satisfied. 
the over 20-man project crew now take up their positions in hotels along the route. The motto here, efficiency before beauty. We have different teams, including image processors, radar experts, people who integrate the hardware, etc. They all have to work with the car. So it's not just the autonomous driving, there are also normal trips where you record measurements, etc. And each team has its slot on the vehicle. In the end, the proposed track area is scanned repeatedly. Then we check what works and what still doesn't work. After that, we come back here and figure it out. That is how it works. And there goes my mobile phone. Taking each stage one at a time, the Mercedes-Benz developers now autonomously navigate the Berta Benz route. The last and crucial phase of the project has begun, and it demands patience, creativity and perfect teamwork. It's much like someone learning how to drive. On the road, we never see the exact same situation twice. And just as young learners, we have to go through a vast learning process so that we can properly assess traffic situations over and over again. That's the challenge. If, say, a new construction site has been set up, we have to take a different route. So it's necessary to constantly update the map. The system has to function anywhere, and 104 kilometers, that's a pretty long distance. The greatest challenge were those narrow roads with parked cars on each side and other cars coming towards us, situations where I, as a human being, would probably prefer to stop. And it really was the hardest thing to teach the vehicle this concept, should I stop or should I go? Persistence, enthusiasm and sheer expertise of the crew pay off in the end. In late August 2013, 125 years after Berta Benz's legendary trip, the S500 Intelligent Drive masters the entire route autonomously. I'm simply relieved. We put so much effort into it, and now it works. We showed that it's possible. I'm relieved, I'm delighted, and I'm truly satisfied with the results. It's a great feeling. We made it. And a big thanks to everybody who contributed and helped to make this possible. As the first car manufacturer worldwide, Mercedes-Benz has mastered an over 100-kilometer route on city and country roads autonomously in regular traffic. The engineers are aware there's still a lot of work to be done until the systems work reliably enough to be implemented on a serial basis. Still, the Berta Benz Drive is the beginning of the right way. A way that leads to more comfort and safety for all of us. The nice thing is, a lot of this is science fiction, but it's doable science fiction. We didn't come up against anything where we were forced to say, this is unsolvable. At this point, we can actually foresee this system making its way to the product stage. But looking in those smiling faces in the end definitely was for most of the traffic, for most of the project participants, a great um, benefit that compensated for much of the doubts that uh, we also experienced during the project course. Well, um, after seeing what happened, uh, we'll look at what the car actually does when it drives autonomously on that road. So first of all, <coughs> the question that I want to ask is, what does the virtual actually see? And um, first, before she sees, she actually has prior information. So she has knowledge stored in a map, in a database that is used to um, make her course. And in contrast to the uh, map, like on the left side here,
here, which was provided in the um, DACR 2007 um, Burden Challenge, uh, called the RoadNet Description File, what some of you will know that. Actually, the map used for Goethe was even more detailed, as shown on the right-hand side. The map had, of course, content in, um, regarding the 3D geometry of the roads, 3D geometry of stacking obstacles that were present, but it also, and that was the foremost purpose of the map, it included a lot of tactical information which is used to make decisions um, to decide whether to stop, whether to make a lane change, whether um, to um, stay on the road and follow the predecessor. And um, what well, uh, maps not only have goodies, uh, also maps have some low lights in particular, like they cause some work which is somewhat even unnatural to normal driving for humans because you have to exactly know where you are. So Berta knows about with an accuracy of better than 10 centimeters in normal conditions where she is, which when I drive my car, I don't know that. And um, additionally, um, something that will need to be solved before such vehicles go to production is how can we validate the map actually? How do we know that right here and right now the map is valid? There's no construction site. The course of the route has not challenged, has not changed, or things like that. The map has three layers. The lowest layer is just made for the purpose of localization. So um, in this uh, layer, we have three landmarks used for the localization task. We have three lane markers are not meant for um, planning at this stage of the map, but they're meant for localization. And we have six, three, uh, 60 camera poses as position and orientation of the camera when recording the map. The next layer is made for the decision making and for the planning. So it includes the 3D geometry um, as we need it for driving. It includes um, information on traffic lights and routes. It includes, as we see, some stop lines and so the vehicle knows when to stop and under what conditions it may traverse such a, a stop line. So basically, tactical information needed for driving is included in that map. And the last layer is actually not um, actually prior information, but the last layer is a dynamic layer. It includes new static obstacles and dynamic obstacles. And therefore, obviously, it is um, augmented during the drive um, build on sensor information. Well, I'm not going to give um, information on all the sensor information. As Ralph already pointed out, radar guys are always um, um, always a little too let, less attention. I apologize for that uh, in my talk as well. Um, but uh, I'll give some information on the main um, sensors that were developed within the Berta project through the vision. So first of all, Berta has to sh see where she actually is. So that's done by visual geometry and localization. So we localize ourselves on the map. So based on the image that we have, we localize where are we and how are we moving. That's, of course, very important information. And that's done by two different localization schemes. One is built on lane marker information. So we have in the map lane marker information in a very high detail. And this lane marker are then thought in the map. And uh, then there's a matching between the lane markers in the map. And the lane marker is actually observed. And then from that, we know where we are. The second localization um, system wants to completely independent. So we have some redundancy in our system. And it is based on visual landmarks. So we have 3D landmarks stored on the map. So let's say those blue landmarks are stored um, with a descriptor describing how actually the image looks at that point. Um, and there's sort of dirt landmarks. So we've seen yesterday some presentations, some poster presentation on that by the people doing that work. Um, and we see on the lower image the image actually recorded by the camera and then it tries to match those landmarks based on the scriptures and knowing at least three of those landmarks we know where we are, we see we actually see a couple of hundred landmarks or even thousand landmarks. Um, so we have a higher um, degree of redundancy in that um, to even compensate for construction sites or for newly parked cars um, or any changes in the road. Um, then Berta sees, of course, what's around her. So we use a front um, stereo camera to see 
what actually what objects are actually seen. And so you may know much of this work done by the Frankie's group. So based on the theory which pay in prayer, first there's a real-time semi-global matching, which produces about half a million 3D points in, in the real world, um, as depicted here. Those are then compacted to about 1,000 super stick zones, stick zones are sort of a ver vertical stick-like structures in the scene that represent a piece of the obstacle. And then those stick zones um, are tracked by visual um, tracking optical flow, and this optical flow then gives us the emotion of those stick cells, and in the last day, actually, um, stick cells are grouped um, to objects, so those stick cells who are in close proximity and have similar motion are then grouped to obstacles, and finally, um, said, well, we color those objects that are moving, and the black objects um, and seen black stick cells represent static. Obstacle. So that's a very important information that we have to draft the prevent suit. Well, what does Berger actually think? How does she see the scene? Well, she has a map, it's depicted here, static stick cells, <coughs> pink here, and moving obstacles. That's mainly the sensor information. And she gets information from the map, so the decision unit tells her what lane it is on and uh, tells Berger um, which is the lane and the rightmost driving corridor it's allowed to take. So if it's allowed to make a lane change, that corridor will move to the left side. Um, and the obstacles, if they're close to the lane, um, or even in the lane, as in this case, some parked cars, um, there are some polygonal envelopes taken to um, Restrict the um, driving corridor to the Venice Olympics. So that's the extraction of the virtual decision um, making unit of the trajectory plan um, for that. I will show that in a short explanatory video. So, first of all, Virtual has a couple of operating modes. She's either ready to autonomous drive and then we have a yellow frame. Or she is in autonomous mode, that's when the frame is free. That was our development. With, but in this presentation, of course, I will not bother you with um, non autonomous um, driving um, pieces. In all the remainder of this talk, um, there will be autonomous drives shown only. Um, well, there is the information from the sensors. Here we see the actual stick cells uh, information, stick cells of the stereo camera, which are the 45 degrees. Field of view seen from one of the stereo images, and um, if you have moving <coughs> stick cells, those stick cells get some different color from the. You can also see some radar objects actually already <coughs> seen, particularly when they're moving. So, um, actually, the radar sensors are very important because um, they have a broader field of view. They brought our camera, front camera, only at 45 degrees of view, we had a 190 field, uh, degree field of view to the front. <coughs> and with the radar sensors in total, the standard S plus actually is only 60 degree field of view, so don't have one sensor with three of those radar sensors in this particular S plus. So we cover 190 <coughs> degree field of view. And that's particularly important, this radar information. When you look at roundabouts, for example, you get vehicles entering the roundabouts, you can see that vehicle much before it is visible, visible in the um, image due to its expanded um, field of view. Well, that's the obstacle information that Virtual has and Virtual uses. And um, finishing the roundabout, this obstacle information is then, of course, used to be fitted in the roadmap. But before we see actually our course on the roadmap, so we have a self localization unit to tell us where is the vehicle on the map. We then look into the map and see the driving corridors of the road boundaries that we have. The decision unit decides for where actually the, um, the left and right most lane boundary um, of our vehicle is that it's allowed to take. So we will then change. Um, we would indicate that from the decision unit, but the trajectory which planner cannot decide on its own to do a lane change um, maneuver or to take a turn. Well, then um, the static obstacles are accumulated over time, so we make sort of 
kind of a of grid map, and then, of course, after this accumulation, um, Berta then has to um, decide which piece of the road is actually drivable for us, where do I plan my trajectory, and that's a particularly um, hard part that we take. So, the next step now is that um, we look at the obstacles that look in our paths and um, generate constraints, driving constraints for that. So the, those green obstacles are static obstacles, uh, static pieces that uh, we believe if we can pass them, we will pass them on the left side. And if the obstacles get marked in red, it means they're close or in our driving corridor and we'll pass them on the right on Osavovic. So these create that polygonal envelopes and they cut out a section of the driving corridor which the nose goes on due to a static obstacle. And through that information, Virgil now tries to plan a trajectory through it, and the trajectory for us is um, illustrated by this course of circles, where the carrots of circles tells us a time, the time when Virgil will be at that position, and the width of the circles is the width of the vehicle. So, and the in case of static obstacles, we see here um, just how Berta traverses some static obstacles, plans its trajectories, it has an intended speed, um, speed and actually um, the trajectory um, generation algorithm has been presented also yesterday on this conference in the poster. The situation gets a little more complicated when other traffic participants enter the field of view, which as you can imagine in central Germany is not a rare situation. Um, and we have here a traffic participant come on. And so what we learned is that we do not only need to plan for ourselves our trajectory, but we also have to plan for others. So we plan for the oncoming um, trajectory, at least uh, traffic participant across trajectory, and also take polygonal envelope. But this time it's are colored. It means it is position of the oncoming vehicle at that particular time encoded by the color. Now our trajectory is safe. If our circles of the trajectory do not match a polygonal envelope of same color, because that only would mean that we are at the same place at the same time, which would be bad, because that would be a collision. Um, but of course, the um, paths of us and oncoming traffic can overlap, can intersect, as long as it doesn't happen at the same time. So we often have had to drive on the oncoming lane, and people from the oncoming lane very often drove on our lane, um, and we just had to cooperate with these other traffic participants. So we see some narrow passages here where we really would really actually give hardly enough space for two vehicles. So at that time, the vehicle decided even to stop. Then when we move on. See the plan for this one kind of vehicle, and if we slow down and try to catch one of those um, gaps where um, unfortunately no vehicle is parking and staying in that um, gap if possible. Look, so, um, what the remainder will be just very, just very quickly. Um, the question is what, we, what did we learn from this? Um, and there are a couple of things, of course. Um, and we just roughly classified them uh, into the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, you see sensors and actuators being most classified as good and bad. Well, the good thing really was, as you can see from Christopher's examples, we really went a long way. I mean, we did not encounter a situation where we uh, found our sensors incapable of assessing the scene. This said, uh, there are, of course, limitations of these sensors uh, when it gets dark. Uh, in heavy rain and so on and so forth. So that actually constitutes an obstacle and that would pose new kind of work for us in the future. As far as the actuators are concerned, yes, the actuators work perfectly well uh, without any fault. Nonetheless, uh, for reasons of functional safety, if we would ever build this into a production vehicle, we have, as I said, to go into uh, a fault tolerant implementation. Um, the good thing, or the best thing about the project was that the motion planning, as you could just see with those clever algorithms, was actually um, working perfectly well. So our assessment is, as soon as you have a clear view of your environment and you know where you are, then motion planning is actually not a very hard portion of uh, the overall algorithms in the system.
what, what is really uh, a challenge is social interaction between the autonomous vehicle and its surroundings. Um, we have funny situations where the vehicle stopped at the crosswalk and, and the pedestrians were waving us through. And of course, as that was not programmed into the system, we would just remain stopped there and that even made some people very furious that we were not going. Um, and of course, the things that were mentioned yesterday, and what you do in emergency situations or with the authorities, would, it, would a police car stop, pull you over or what could happen there? I mean, that, that's an issue that eventually has to be solved. I mean, I'm, I have lots of other problems that I would solve before that, but eventually you need to cross that bridge. What is really ugly in the long term for different reasons are the pieces of localization and mapping and the traffic light issue. Um, the mapping and the localization, as you saw from uh, Christopher's presentation, um, is doable. It's just um, a horrendous effort. It's not that it cannot be done. We're teaming up with Nokia and they're getting ramped up on, on doing this, uh, but it's really a lot of effort. Um, and you have to get it right, and you have to implement clever updating algorithms so that you know if something's wrong in the map and you then are able to find that out with your sensors because you never can fully, fully rely on what you're having there. Traffic lights are different, uh, or are, are as ugly, but for different reasons because traffic lights, um, you need to really identify and classify 100% right, because otherwise you may cause a catastrophic failure going over a red light, going into an intersection, and then being hit by cross traffic or hit cross traffic. Um, and traffic lights are really a challenge because, uh, as was already seen in the video, um, you have to see them um, in different fields of view, even when you're stuck at the traffic light. In the US traffic lights are much more convenient for or assessment is that far away from where you are stopped, but if you're stopped at a German intersection, uh, the traffic light sometimes is right behind you or above you, and that's pretty difficult for a camera to see unless you use a wide angle camera, which comes with other problems then because the pixels from which you can detect the traffic light are that very tiny or very few. Um, you don't want to stop because you are uncertain of whether you can identify the traffic light unless you get honked at, and that was one of the challenges that we defined over the course of the project. We did not want to get honked at, so that was sort of a very clear aim for the project that only evolved in the project. Um, so you need to see those, and then of course, if you're faced with several traffic lights, you need also to find out which one is, is the right one. So um, all I can say in this audience, uh, if you don't know what to work on, Work on traffic lights because that's something, if you can solve that, if you can solve that good, that will benefit all of us and it is an amazingly hard problem. So, um, we've started to work on it, but uh, hopefully we get more input and more content contributions on that. So what do we do now? We um, are moving sort of on different paths. Of course, we continue this good collaboration with Karlsruhe, which has really worked out well. Um, in both in terms of, of the teams working together and also in terms of um, the result that came out. For us, really, the challenge is in Daimler to come up with um, future versions of the intelligent drive system that cover this terrain. Um, and we'll probably do this step by step. It's not going to be a switch that we pull and then we say, well, then now from now on, we can drive highly autonomously in all scenarios. This will be by scenario and by degree of automation. And that's what you'll be seeing. And as for Paltzwood, there's a big project coming up. Well, thanks, Aaron. It's not that big, and I'll just put that in a very few words. We'll, we'll work on connected vehicles. Um, we've seen that uh, actually in the presentation of Jonathan Peter yesterday that there are some issues with connected vehicles, in particular if you have many birders running around, right now with three birders, if they would meet, um, they should sort of communicate and um, then expand their knowledge and maybe even not only decide on themselves how to move, but even um, expand um, and start to negotiate with others um, and maybe negotiate another collaborative driving course and then learn together in a collective um, <coughs> And that brings us to the finish um, um, slide. And uh, we, um, on behalf of Rath and myself, I want to thank all the people who actually did the work that we've just 
being presented. Many of those are even in this room. I hope we have time for at least one or two questions.